We made it. It's the last talk, right? <laughs> you can put down your pencils. I'm not going to talk about any science. I'm not going to make you think about complex pathways. I want you to think about the disparities in our world. And I want you to think about how you might be able to help. And I want to give a shout out to CGC. There have been threads of this throughout this meeting, hints about global needs, hints about uh, ways that we can leapfrog technologies and think about things for um, underprivileged laboratories. And we always say, go home and hug your kids. Well, go home and hug your labs because we have so much in this country. But I, I want to tell you a story um, about a change, a maybe leap of faith that I took a few years ago um, after being a, a clinical lab director at Nationwide Children's for 20 years. Um, I decided to follow a dream, and that was to figure out what can we do in a global setting to try to bring genomics to more patients. And so I have a few cute kids to show you. I have a few not so cute lab members to show you, uh, but we'll see here. So about four years ago, I joined a program called Global Hope. And uh, this, this program is based out of Texas Children's and Baylor College of Medicine. And the aim is to try to improve outcomes for kids with cancer and pediatric disorders in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, pediatric disorders specifically blood. It's really a capacity building program, so we're not trying to get samples sent to Houston. We're not trying to uh, necessarily have people in Houston do the work. The idea is build up the technology, the infrastructure, and the personnel on site to be able to sustain a program and can have continued improvement in these outcomes for these kids. So it started about 2016. We built a PEDS Hemonc Fellowship Program in Uganda. And uh, the idea was they don't specialize a lot in Africa. So they have general um, hematologists. They have general pathologists. They don't have people that can really be able to treat these kids. And so we started a fellowship program. And since then, we had 24 graduates from the program uh, that have now gone back to their host countries and we try to continue to support. So if you're like me, I knew very little about Africa geography when I started this role a few years ago. But this shows you, uh, gives you an idea of the sites that we're working in right now. Um, I'm very fortunate and I want to say some of you have met my colleague, Dr. Vera Ngazu, who's here from Tanzania. She's been training with us for a few months in the States and is getting ready to go back. So thank you for the warm welcome that some of you have given her. Um, but basically, the idea here is what we, after our, our fellows go back to their host institutions, we try to continue to support them as they build a peds hemonc program. Well, when I joined the program a few years ago, there was really no emphasis on pathology or laboratory medicine, certainly not genomics. We have no genomics, um, really, except on a small basis and research projects um, in sub-Saharan Africa. So, What's the challenge? Well, this is a huge challenge, right? So in the U.S., we know we see about 15,000 kids with pediatric cancer every year, um, and about 80 to 90 percent survive. It's almost flip-flopped in Africa, so huge childhood cancer issue, more than 100,000 cases in sub-Saharan Africa, a very young population, so we have a lot more kids there, and about 90 percent of them die. This is a very significant disparity. So why, why is the burden so great? So I'm not going to get into all these. Uh, I mentioned the young population. Uh, access to cancer drugs, I will tell you our program has a multi-million dollar per year partnership with several pharmaceutical companies and the organization Direct Relief. So we're starting to get the drugs that we need to treat these kids, although we haven't been able to get more toward targeted therapy. But as you know, even if we could get targeted therapy, if we don't have any genomics and any testing to identify the kids, it doesn't do us a lot of good. So we have to do both. Um, but I want to talk more about the laboratory and pathology issues. So there's definitely an inadequate healthcare structure and a significant delay in diagnosis. So I want to give you a couple more specifics because I think it's, it's been eye-opening to me. So we heard our colleague from India talk about maybe 10% of their patients that they kind of have to stratify based on no income, not able to pay. A lot of our sites are closer to 90%, cannot, cannot pay. Well, why is that? Well, just to give you an idea, I pulled these out of World Bank data. In the US, on average, we have about $146 a day to live. In one of our sites, Malawi, which is one of the poorest countries in the world, they have $1.52 per day to live. So how are they gonna pay for any testing? You know, we can't even get a CBC for $1.50, right? So this is a real challenge. 
And the thing is, they do so much with so little. And their governments really do want to bring the best to their constituents, but they really don't have the resources to do it. So we have to think differently about this. Um, so a lot of the governments do kind of cover most costs of healthcare, not true in all countries, but some. But let me give you an example. So pathology is not covered. So basic H&E diagnosis, not always covered because they don't think that's critical. Okay, we're talking a basic H&E, right? So we have a lot of education to do. We work with the ministries of health. We work with the governments to try to help prioritize some of these diagnostic methods. But obviously H&E is probably going to be above a genomic assay. And then finally, I want to I wanna give a, a little bit of a, a, a plea, maybe a beg, <laughs> which I do a lot of begging with companies. Um, we really need strong industry partnership in these global settings. And why is that? So, you know, you hear companies say, well, we have, we're bringing this to Africa because we have a distributor in South Africa. You can get the reagents there. The truth is they can't really get the reagents there. Um, I won't mention the extraction kit I'm listing here. You can probably guess what it is. We pay about $528 for 50 reactions in Houston. Um, it's marked up to almost double in Uganda. I recently uh, had a quote for a chemistry instrument uh, in Uganda. Um, I had a quote from Uganda, got it requoted in the US to see if we could buy it here and, and ship it over 129K here, over 220,000 in Uganda. So we need partnerships that think about the economies of these countries and say, we need compassionate pricing for this testing if we're gonna get there at all. Okay, so, you know, I came in and I'm thinking I can solve everything tomorrow. You know, I'm a type A, let's get it done kind of person. The reality is very frustrating, but very rewarding process. Okay, so one of my tasks, so I, I work over all areas, including point of care when we can't get a CBC in Malawi after five o'clock, not kidding you. Um, you know, virtual path, all kinds of areas. But of course, with my background in genomics, I wanted to try to start baby steps to bring genomics to our sites. And so I'm not gonna go through the slide. I think most of us know, we've heard several times in this meeting, pediatric cancers are very low mutational burden, right? We don't have a lot of point mutations. We have lots of uh, structural variations, particularly gene fusions, and we have quite a few copy number alterations, including aneuploidy, amplifications, et cetera. So when I started thinking about this, I had to look at lots of platforms and say, okay, what could we realistically do as the first step? What would give us the most bang for our buck and also be possible in this low resource setting? And so what we decided to do was really focus on fusion genes because we know that about 50% of pediatric cancers have fusion genes. And we know they can have a diagnostic effect, a prognostic effect. So by the way, ALLs, all of them get treated the same at our sites. Okay, we don't have risk stratification. So if we can do something about prognosis, and then of course the goal is always targeted therapy, right? I will tell you just as a side, cause I'll come back to it. We do have a matnib, okay? So it'll become important in a minute. Um, the ideal platform in a sub-Saharan setting uh, would be rapid. I told you about delays in diagnosis. Sometimes we will have weeks or months before we get a patho pathological diagnosis back. A kid might be treated for three months on the wrong therapy. Okay. We need something fairly quick, cost effective, which is relative, <laughs> uh, robust high detection rate, and really, I couldn't think about going to next gen off the bat, right? We don't have the informatics capability. We need more training on the ground. I had to think about something with those fairly um, low, low um, technical training required so that we could actually think about implementing this. So I challenge you, if you have other ideas on this, reach out to me <laughs> because we're always looking for other things. So I have no connection to Nanostring whatsoever. Um, we did decide to go with this platform because of a couple of things that, that I'll mention. One is that it's, it's pretty fast. We can get a plus minus assay for fusions in about three days. Over there, re realistically, we'll fill a plate because we want to be economically, um, you know, th thinking about the cost. Um, and so we'll probably batch every week or two. But the idea, is it's very easy technically. This is a plus minus assay, but you do have to design probes to every fusion breakpoint that you want. So for example, BCR ABLE that we know of about three or four, or actually seven in the literature. So we had to design seven different probe sets to pick up all the BCR ABLEs. Um, but the idea, 
um, in terms of technical expertise, on the ground, you, you isolate your RNA, you mix it with the reagents, it hives overnight. So you're talking about 10, 15 minutes on day one. The next day we come in, we load it on the cartridge, takes about 10 or 15 minutes of tech time, and it runs for six hours and you, and you get the readout. So you can tell very little time on the ground spent uh, running this, which is one reason we went there. And also it's a plus minus assay, so you don't need a ton of informatics on the other end to read this. So just to give you an idea, I spent probably six months at the beginning of this uh, designing these probe sets with nanostring. These are all custom. They're huge, huge panels, and why? We have no idea what the genomic makeup of the tumors in, in Africa is. So we took all your common fusions, we took some more rare fusions, but one limitation is they have to be perfect breakpoints, which we know we'll miss some. But again, I'm not thinking with my American hat on where I'm gonna get sued if I miss something. I'm trying to make it just a small incremental difference, right? So this is, uh, we have a tumor set for um, solids as well as heme, and we validated this in Houston. And so we had, we don't have samples that have been genomically characterized in Africa, but we do at Texas Children's in Houston. And so we ran about 150 samples. It actually worked extremely well. Um, I can get into more details if, if somebody wants to get into it, but I know you can't read this slide, but this is a general, it's a huge spreadsheet of rows of probe sets and across the top are the RNAs. And what we've done is built some templates so that at the bottom you have housekeeping genes. If they're red, the sample's not very good. And if you see a yellow, that's over five standard deviations above the average background that we got in the validation. And so those would be your putative positive. So we're trying to build tools so that our directors on, on site without a ton of training um, can go ahead and interpret these. So here's one of my uh, photos from we just started, we just implemented this summer. We're just starting this, so very early. Um, we are testing in Uganda and Malawi right now on retrospective samples that have been consented. I just wanna give you a little bit of an idea. So we all know this kind of diagram, all the different things you see in BALL. On the right are the first 14 samples in Uganda. We're seeing kind of the same types of abnormalities that we see here, but most importantly, there are three kids at the top there that they could treat with lamatinib. Okay. Similar in AML, right? So I just want to give you uh, one quick story to end, two quick stories to end. One, I wanted to know, was this really working, right? So when I was in Uganda, um, sorry, we had two kids here that um, were positive for PML RARA. I didn't know which kids these were. Talked to the medical director, he opened up his laptop and he said, sure enough, by flow and by morphology, these kids have APL. Similarly, the one on the bottom is from Malawi. This kid has a P EBF1 PDGRF beta. Those of you that know pH like ALL, it's one of the first ones described and they have terrible outcomes. They have 70% MRD, et cetera. I saw the medical director and I said, hey, I got this kid that I'm kind of worried about. And he said, oh, who is it? I don't know, I, I only have codes. These are retrospective. He said, I know who exactly who it is. He failed induction. Two days later, he sends me the code, sure enough. So I think we're encouraged with the results, and I'll just uh, end by saying that we're also looking at copy number. Shameless plug, if there's anybody out there that really loves informatics, not me, uh, we have a challenge with the copy number platform in that it's designed to not, to be on diploid tumors, which a lot of tumors are not in the pediatric world. Just like arrays where we sometimes have to reset the, the zero mark because it's triploid, I have the same problem with this. So we're still trying to work on this, but we're hoping we can get some of those other abnormalities. So I just wanna thank um, the teams at the sites. Uh, I work within genomic medicine at Texas Children's, and then obviously our wonderful kids that we're trying to improve care for. Thank you.